Good morning and welcome. This is the public business meeting of the Judicial Council of California for Tuesday, September 24, 2019 in Sacramento. The meeting's now in session. Uh, so we will now begin our public comment section of our meeting, giving the public an opportunity to provide us with general public thoughts and comments. Please remember that this is a time for public comment regarding general judicial administration issues. Uh, public comment regarding specific discussion items will be called immediately before that discussion item. Please keep in mind that we are not an adjudic adjudicatory body. The Judicial Council cannot make any individual decisions in any particular cases. And we ask, therefore, that you refrain from talking about uh, those uh, individual specifics about a case or individuals involved in those cases. And that includes uh, witnesses, people involved in the case, the court, personnel, and or all parties. I will call your name if you are listed. Please, uh, when you hear your name, come forward to the podium. You will have three minutes uh, on the podium. There are lights, and that will provide you with the time frame. When you have one minute remaining, there will be a yellow light. I'll call out three names, and I would ask uh, the first one to please step up to the podium, and the other two stand up and be positioned uh, fairly closely behind so we can just move through the process fairly um, easily. So uh, the first is Thomas Coleman, sir, if you would step forward, followed by Lisa McCarley, and then followed by Ms. Linda Kincaid. Good morning, sir. Good morning. My name is Thomas F. Coleman, and I'm legal director of Spectrum Institute. I'd like to thank Staff Attorney Corby Sturgis and the members of the Probate and Mental Health Advisory Committee for developing the new training requirements for court-appointed attorneys in conservatorship proceedings. As members of the bench and bar, we all have a duty to make sure these trainings result in effective advocacy for seniors and people with disabilities. That is <coughs> excuse me, not likely to happen without high quality training programs, the adoption of performance standards, and new monitoring mechanisms. There is a role for the Supreme Court and the State Bar in this implementation process. Please refer to an op-ed article in last Wednesday's edition of the Daily Journal for more details uh, on this. Now I want to pivot to a different but related issue. ADA non-compliance by the entire judicial branch. Rule 1.100 on disability accommodations and educational materials of the Judicial Council are misinforming judges of their sua sponte duties under the ADA. This rule and these materials are premised on a misunderstanding that requests for accommodations must be made. The current message is no request equals no accommodation. That is contrary to federal law. Spectrum Institute has submitted a report to the Judicial Council on this subject with a request that it take immediate steps to advise judges and the public that courts do have a duty to provide accommodations for known disabilities that interfere with effective communication or meaningful participation in a court proceeding even without a request. And this is especially crucial in probate conservatorship proceedings where the court learns on the filing of a verified petition that the person has disabilities that are so significant that the petitioner wants someone to take over their entire life. And yet some courts are not even appointing an attorney to represent the individuals. I offer my assistance to work with your ADA coordinator and with the Fairness and Access Advisory Committee to remedy this problem. Together, I think we can hopefully make the ADA accommodation system come into conformity with the goals that the Chief Justice just said uh, out of your mission statement about access to all and fairness for all. That isn't currently happening, but it can with some adjustments. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next is Ms. Lisa McCarley. And then following would be um, 
the next up would be Ms. Kincaid, followed by Mr. Richard Calhoun. So, go ahead, ma'am. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Lisa McCarley. I am an attorney, and I have been appearing on behalf of families, fiduciaries, and litigants in Southern California probate courts week in and week out for over 25 years, in the trenches, so to speak. And I will try to give you a glimpse of what the probate court battlefield looks like from my point of view. Because I cannot possibly tell you about all of the heartbreak and trauma I have witnessed over the last dozen years in three minutes, I have created a notebook, amateurish, amateurish and awkward, I know, but it gives a hint of the dark reality of probate court. I have a few copies to leave with you. A few years ago, a coalition of families whose loved ones were essentially kidnapped and financially abused in Las Vegas were able to document their ep efforts in the racket they discovered in a documentary called The Guardians by Millie, Billy Mintz. I highly recommend that documentary to any person who wishes to better understand how quickly the probate courts become complicit in abuse. <clears throat> During the filming of the documentary, a family member coined a phrase to describe the modus operandi of the elder abusers as follows, isolate the victim, defame legitimate protectors, and liquidate the estate. Similarly, California probate courts are not functioning as they should be, and this absolutely must be addressed before the baby boomers hit their 80s in a few short years. The wealth held by the Golden State senior community, the longevity which leads to growth in dementia-related illnesses, and the lack of competent oversight of our adjudicating courts has made exploitation of the vulnerable through conservatorships proceedings a lucrative business for attorneys, professional fiduciaries, and retired judges who charge up to $800 an hour to resolve the sundry disputes. The real-life trauma and miscarriages of justice that results from inappropriate advocacy affects every range of our economic spectrum. A beloved radio personality, a beloved Orange County Superior Court judge, a former NFL quarterback, and the autistic uh, uh, son of a poor Russian immigrant, a man with the mental age of three or four who was routine, routinely handcuffed, hands behind his back and feet, and left naked on his backyard. This was not investigated competently, and the County of Los Angeles paid the people who tortured this poor, developmentally disabled man $150,000 because the probate courts failed him. I have researched viable, cost-effective, readily implemented alternatives to the current court-appointed probate court system, and I've submitted my proposals to our governor, Senator, my Senator Portentino, Senator Umberg, and I beseech you to please consider the proposals. I have them in writing. I have them here for you. Thank you. We need help in the trenches in our probate court. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Next up is uh, Ms. Linda Kincaid, again followed by Mr. Richard Calhoun. I'm Linda Kincaid with the Coalition for Elderly and Disability Rights. We are the sponsors of Senate Bill 303, which seeks to protect conservatees' homes. SB 303 passed through the legislature with unanimous support. The bill is now on the governor's desk. The Judicial Council opposes protections for conservatees' homes. This council asked the governor to veto SB 303. I'll read from legislative analysis from SB 303. In 2006, the legislature passed the Omnibus Conservatorship and Guardianship Reform Act, a landmark package of bills to overhaul California's troubled conservatorship system. That legislative package was designed to remedy alarming deficiencies in California's conservatorship system that had resulted in the abuses of California's elderly and most vulnerable. Unfortunately, the important new court oversights were never funded and as a result, are not mandated today. That bill was passed in 2006. Probate courts approve over 96% of conservatorship petitions. In nine years of watching conservatorship courts, we have never seen a probate court follow the probate code. California's probate courts fail to protect Californians' civil rights. We ask this council 
to at least support protections for conservatees' homes. Thank you, ma'am. Next up is Mr. Richard Calhoun. Good morning. I'm Richard Calhoun. I'm a volunteer with CEDAR. CEDAR stands for the Coalition of Elder Independent Adult Rights. If court practices came close to following the California Probate Code, CEDAR would never have been formed. This council's letter, first opposing SB 303 and then asking for a governor veto, shows that this council is completely out of touch with what's happening in your court system here. It's only a matter of time before we have a new documentary film out. It's going to be called The Conservatorship. It's going to make the guardians in Las Vegas look like cakewalk. This court system is messed up. CEDAR is requesting a no-cost access to your court records. Right now, it costs a fortune to look at your records and get data that you are not willing to provide. What have our volunteers uncovered when we looked at your court records? We have found nothing but complete, utter approval of anything and everything. What am I talking about? We can go to the bank eight times in one day and bill each of those eight times. Or did we really only go once and bill eight times the work we really performed? We can bill and get approved by the court going to a CPA's doc office to doc drop off documents 13 times in one calendar day. I'm sorry, a postage stamp is a lot cheaper to the estate, but that would reduce the income to the conservatorship industry. Okay, those are subjective. Let's look at billable hours. I know your court works long hours. When was the last time one of your courts was open for 12.2 hours in one day? You know, the courts I go to, two and a half hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon is about the best you can get. 12.2 hours billed in one day. Okay, still subjective. Let's get to some real numbers. Most consultants say that they bill about 75% of their work day to clients. Welcome to conservatorship. We bill 250% of a 24-hour day. Yes, your courts are approving 60 hours of billable time on a single calendar day, and that gets approved routinely in multiple counties in the state of California. You don't think we need protection? These are conservatives. These are vulnerable people. There is a huge problem, and for your counsel to sit here and oppose doing something, let's look at the Motor Vehicle Code. Every one of those sections has a penalty if I violate it. The probate code does not have a single penalty for a single section. So you can limit a contemporary conservatorship to 30 days, but if it goes on for the lifetime of that conservatee, nothing happens because there's no consequence. Wake up, start giving <coughs> us our rights back. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And Chief, that is the uh, end of public comment.